Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 6N, the last lecture of Module 6. And we're going to talk about how DNA typing can be used in various areas of ecology. We'll talk about a technique called species barcoding and how it can be used for species identification. We'll talk about um, a new research area called the human microbiome, and we'll talk about using environmental DNA um, to characterize ecosystems. You might be surprised to learn that many ecologists are now more dependent on DNA se sequencing techniques than they are on gumboots and butterfly nets that are the traditional tools of ecology. And this has come to be because DNA is just as good for ecological studies as it is for forensic work such as DNA fingerprinting. All species have it and all species like us leave traces of it wherever they go. DNA is stable in natural environments as well as human environments and just as every human has a distinct DNA fingerprint, every animal, every animal species or plant species has unique sequences that can be used to identify them. For example, DNA can be obtained from dead organisms, from museum specimens such as dried butterflies illustrated in this museum sample case here. That can allow us to ask questions about what was the population diversity, the species diversity, of a particular kind of animal in a particular environment that may no longer even exist. DNA can be extracted from feces, not just the DNA of the bacteria or of the food that the animal ate, but also the DNA of the animal itself because we all shed our own epithelial cells into our feces from our intestinal tract. This has allowed ecologists who study um, animals that are difficult to make direct physical contact with to um, investigate the genetics of the populations. For example, researchers studying orangutans find it very difficult to find and trap an orangutan, and it's very stressful for the orangutan as well. But instead, they can simply collect orangutan droppings from the jungle floor and use DNA sequencing to identify all the members of a population. Um, they can establish who's the parents of who, um, who's a new immigrant into the population. Whale biologists have come to rely extensively on DNA typing extracted from whale skin samples and they collect these samples using a specially designed arrow that's fitted to a crossbow. This arrow has a small hollow dart on the tip that penetrates the whale's skin and removes a plug about the size of the eraser of a pencil. The dart then falls off and floats so the researchers can bring their boat over and retrieve the arrow with the DNA sample. This allows them to specifically identify individual members of whale populations. Now, an important component of these studies is a technique called species barcoding. This was developed by Canadian researchers, actually, as a standardized way to use DNA sequencing to identify species. And it's been going on as the Barcode of Life project with the goal of obtaining identifying DNA sequence for every significant species on the planet, maybe except bacteria. Now, the barcode is, in this context, a barcode isn't a pattern of black and white stripes. It's a 600 base pair DNA sequence from a particular gene. This gene is part of the mitochondrial DNA. We'll talk a bit more about this a little later, and the gene that's used is cytochrome oxidase, usually abbreviated COI. This gene has the advantage of being present in almost all eukaryotes. It's highly conserved because it's pretty much essential. It's an easy gene to sequence. It's highly variable between species, but it's not very variable within species. 
so it serves as a unique identifier that distinguishes different species. Um, in the background, I've pasted the DNA sequence of barcodes from two different species, Sepiotuthus lessoniana, which is a little squid, and Sardinia melanura, which is a little fish. Both of these are species where there may be what are called cryptic species, species that are genetically distinct but that physically look very similar. DNA barcode coding allows researchers to find out how many species there really are. Here's an example of something that can be done with DNA barcoding. This is a project that was carried out by a group called the Oceana Foundation. And they wanted to know how accurate were the records of the fish that were being sold and eaten in um, restaurants and groceries. And so they traveled around the U.S. and collected samples of fish from restaurants, from sushi restaurants, and from groceries and fish markets, and then they used DNA barcoding to identify the species of the fish that they bought. And what they discovered was an enormous amount of mislabeling of fish. The particular graphic here is the results for a fish called red snapper, which you've probably seen um, on sale where you live. Um, most of the red snapper that they bought was not red snapper at all. Much of it wasn't snapper at all. Um, and this is important not just because of truth in advertising, we want to feel like we're getting what we're paid for, but it's very important in terms of conservation of species because human populations are whittling away at all of the large fish species on the planet now. And m even many fish that we think there's lots of may be in much more danger of extinction than we think if we've not identified the species correctly. Now, one use of um, DNA analysis that's particularly exciting is a new field called microbiome analysis. A microbiome is a term for all of the different species of microbes, usually just the bacteria, that normally live in an environment. And because bacteria are so small, Many very small things can be an environment. There can be several different microbiome environments in a flower pot, for instance, and there's certainly many different microbiome environments on our bodies. Now, the graphic on the right shows you um, the most dramatic information about the bacteria on our bodies. I mean, we know there are bacteria in our bodies. We know there are bacteria in our gut, but there are more of them than there are of us. Um, all of the cells in our body together are about 5 times 10 to the 10th cells. That's about 50 billion cells of us with our genome in them. But there are about 10 times as many cells of bacteria in our body. Um, so, and those genomes are not just all the same genome, they're thousands of different species of bacteria. Microbiomes are analyzed by obtaining a sample of the microbial environment. It could be a scraping from your teeth before you've brushed them. It could be a spoonful of dirt. Um, the big stuff is washed away and the bacterial DNA is extracted and sequenced. Sometimes all the DNA is sequenced, sometimes just the um, DNA of one of the ribosomal RNA molecules, which serves the same barcoding function in bacteria that the COI gene does in eukaryotes. And then the sequences are compared to known bacterial sequences. That's where this information about our microbiome came from. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you some much more dramatic and almost sort of creepy results from a big international project called the Human Microbiome Project. And this was a study of skin bacteria, studying different skin microbiomes on our body. And you'll see there's about 20 or so different sites on our body that they studied. You wouldn't have thought there were 20 different environments just on our skin. And they all had different populations of bacteria. Each circle here is a pie chart showing the proportions of different types of bacteria. 
The color codes indicate the different types. These are very distantly related groups of bacteria. And you can see that all of these sites had different communities of bacteria in them. So we are extremely diverse ecosystems. Many different ecosystems, all very diverse, are part of our own bodies. Now, one other way to obtain DNA is what's called environmental DNA. Um, DNA that can be simply extracted directly from environments. Um, there's, for example, there's lots of DNA in lake water and in ocean water, too. And that DNA comes from all the organisms that live there. So analysis of DNA can be used to tell us what kinds of organisms are present when those organisms are perhaps elusive and hard to find. So we could ask what fish live in this lake by collecting some lake water, extracting the DNA from it, and then sequencing all the COI gene segments, the barcodes. If we look for matches to known taxa in the barcode database, we can identify all the fish, essentially, that are present in the lake. Um, this technique is being used in the Great Lakes of North America to screen for the presence of Asian carp, which have been invading northward, moving up through the U.S., and there's great fear that Asian carp will move into the Great Lakes. So they're monitoring for this by assaying environmental DNA for barcodes of great of um, Asian carp. You can also use this analysis to ask about other organisms in the lake water, plant species, animal species, microbe species. The final um, environmental DNA analysis I want to talk about is something called metagenomics, which bypasses identification of organisms entirely. Metagenomics is a way to directly analyze the metabolic pathways in an environment, especially in an environment where the metabolism is dominated by microbes. Um, many like contaminated mine sites, it's the microbes that are metabolizing the contaminants, or many different kinds of marine or lake ecosystems, or soil bacteria. And what's done is to extract all of the microbial DNA, kind of like the um, microbiome analysis, but instead of identifying the gene species, the species, the DNA sequences are used just to identify the gene functions, not worrying about which species this gene came from, but what kind of a protein it codes for. And then the totality of all the metabolic functions in the environment is used to predict how resources such as energy and nutrients are flowing through the community. So what we've done is we've considered many different uses for DNA analysis in ecology, both for characterizing populations, for preserving biodiversity, and for conservation research. Coming up next, for most of you, will be an exam, because this is the last lecture of Module 6 and the last lecture of Part 1 of Useful Genetics. Um, after the exam, we'll start Part 2 with Module 7, where we'll talk about how inheritance works, starting in the first lecture of Module 7 with the cell division process called mitosis. I hope to see you there.